include these advanced effects, what's called signal non-locality, and how that's a great uh, uh, in, uh, you know, shift paradigm shift in physics. And what, what uh, Valentini shows is that ordinary quantum theory, the kind of quantum theory you learn in school, and the kind of quantum theory that particle accelerators at CERN, scattering theory, they just work for simple systems. And these systems are what are, are they're, they're in therm, what, they're what are called, they're in subquantal thermal equilibrium. In that case, you do not get any net advanced effects. But for living systems, like us, biological systems, we are far from thermodynamic equilibrium, and the conditions of ordinary quantum mechanics are expanded into what I call a post-quantum theory. Uh, Bernard Carr, who's now still a professor of physics at the University of London, Queen Mary College, who was a former assistant to, uh, to Stephen Hawking, has uh, written a review paper on this in June, you know, where he puts it all together. So uh, these ideas, are, you know, everything's in the air now, and, uh, but here's the thing. Now you think there's sort of a convergence happening here? There's or? a convergence happening here. With retro, it's called retrocausality. Oh, in fact, in fact, uh, the, in June of 2006, the American Association for the Advancement of Science had a meeting at the University of San Diego, the AAAS, and a guy named Danny Sheehan, not the political Danny Sheehan, but a, uh, a physicist named Dan, Daniel Sheehan. He's the head of the physics department at uh, the Jesuit School, uh, University of San Diego, had a retrocausality workshop Okay, with Dick Bierman was there, I was there, uh, Jack Deesh was actually there, this, and uh, Mike Ibbison, who works for uh, uh, Hal Putoff. Ibbison actually has a theory involving this Wheel of Feynman stuff too. Uh, uh, and uh, they were, and uh, Russell Tog was there. Russell Tog ran the CIA remote viewing experiments with Hal Putoff back in the 70s, and Russell gave convincing evidence of CIA monitored precognitive remote viewing experiments with this kind of wheel of Feynman effects occurring, in which the psychic, unbeknownst to the psychic remote view, I think it was Ingo Swan, I'm not sure, I think it was Ingo Swan, uh, correctly predicted a Chinese nuclear explosion four days before it happened that it would be a nuclear burnout. And uh, uh, Ingo uh, had no, they had no idea what, where these coordinates were, that this, this was a controlled central intelligence agency experiment that the CIA knew that the Chinese were going to do this test, and it happened just, you know, in any case. So there's all this kind of, like, dramatic evidence coming in for the reality of these backwards-in-time effects. Okay, so now let's go back to Wheeler and Feynman. 1940, and then they published again in, the, in 1945, 1946, after the war. There was a flurry of activity. And it actually, these ideas of advanced effects actually uh, influenced the way Feynman did his big Nobel Prize work in, in uh, quantum electrodynamics dynamics and even renormalization, because it turns out there's something the Feynman propagator in quantum field theory, which is how uh, particles move from one point in space time to another point in space time. It turns out the Feynman propagator has both the retarded and the advanced effect in it. It's already there in quantum electrodynamics, so it's kind of buried, you know, it's buried under the rug. But what here's here's what happened. What um, what Will and Feynman found was that. At that point, you know, we didn't know much about the universe. Back in 1940, it was still almost like an island universe. It was only like, uh, well, no, uh, uh, Hubble had already seen there were other galaxies, but we didn't know too much about it. I mean, cosmology was still like uh, a philophosy, what Einstein calls, I mean, what Feynman calls philophosy. It was a lot of speculation, a lot of, you know, metaphysics was not, uh, uh, it was not, you know, we didn't have enough information, we didn't have enough technology. But what they found was, was the following. If, in the future, you have what's called a total 100% absorber. If you have a total absorber, that is if every photon that's ever emitted in the past is eventually absorbed, then what happens? Something very interesting happens. You have, like a, you have like a very interesting effect. You have retrocausality without retrocausality. What happens is it looks as though time is flowing in only one direction, past the future because this future is over. It's like all these advanced effects kind of cancel out, cancel each other out, and it looks as if, you know, you have ordinary irreversibility of the arrow of time, that things are moving only one way forward at a time, and that you don't have any of these precognitive effects, at least on a certain scale. Okay, but the fact was, the problem was then, that when we knew Hubble already discovered that the universe is expanding. And when people like Hoyle, Fred Hoyle, 
uh, in Cambridge and his student Nalakar, an Indian physicist named Nalakar, when you applied the Wheel of Feynman theory to the, to the ordinary Big Bang expanding universe theory, uh, it didn't quite work, didn't fit. There was not a total absorber. There wasn't a total absorber there. So things, you know, didn't quite work. So the uh, uh, Wheel of Feynman theory was kept, like, it was not, you know, a lot of scientists, don't, physicists don't even learn about it. And it's kind of there, but it's kind of hanging in limbo. Okay, now what has happened uh, in the course of writing the paper with Creon Levitt uh, uh, about a year ago, Creon discovered a PhD dissertation by a young lady named Tamara Davis, who just got her PhD from the University of New South Wales in 2004, and one of her advisors was uh, uh, Paul Davies, who was a very visionary guy, who knows all about holograms and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, and so in any case, that picture, that when Creon showed me her thesis, there's a, two pictures in her thesis. One's called figure 1.1, 1 .1, the other's figure 5.1. As, as soon as I saw that picture, everything kind of clicked because here's what happens. Here's, here's what, what's really going on here with the Wheel of Fine picture. Okay, what Tamara Davis did in her PhD was take all the current data that we have, the best data, the data on WMAP, uh, you have the dark energy data, the dark matter data, the type that, uh, uh, and uh, take all this data and make a computer simulation using, you know, modern day computers. Uh, and what she did, she developed, and at this point we have to put in the pictures and, and maybe the next time we'll be able to, you know, show you with the pictures. But here's the picture that comes out. Here's the way to picture us, the, our actual, what's called the observable universe. Our observable universe is not the entire universe, there may be other parallel universes, it gets in this multi, multiverse picture too that's coming up. But here's what happens. If we look now, we have, we're existing here on the planet or on, on, on Earth, we have a bunch of telescopes and all kinds of equipment, right? And we look at, into the sky now, okay, with our telescopes and our radio telescopes, our optical telescopes, our various probes, our, our uh, cosmic ray counters, all that stuff, the Hubble Space Telescope, all that stuff. We're, okay, we're made, those telescopes, they're collecting information from our past. Okay, that, what's called along our past life cone. But because uh, space-time is curved, that past life cone is warped, it, has, it depends how you plot it, but it has like a warped shape, it goes back to that point, the Big Bang. Okay. And, but at any, at any time, at any time, we can only see f as far back you can imagine, you can imagine there's a, a sphere, a spherical surface that surrounds us. But in our past, that's called our past horizon. Our past, it's, a, it's like a bubble. It's like the past particle, which he calls the particle horizon. It's that past horizon. And we really can't see signals that we're getting, the retarded signals we're getting. Are we, on, are we on the edge of that sphere? No, no, we're in the center, we're in the center of the center sphere. Of okay. We're in the center. That's as far as it goes billions of light years. Okay. And, but we can't see beyond that because what's called infinite redshift. We can't, we can't see beyond that. We can't see we, uh, how far we can see into our past. It's limited by this, by this uh, the sphere and its radius is changing as, as, as time moves forward. So as, as, as the universe expands, that the, the, uh, the radius, the, the distance of that sphere from us is, is changing. But also, there's a future sphere as well. So it's the past and there's the future as well. And that future sphere is called our future event horizon. Okay, it's a future horizon. And we're getting closer and closer to it, but we never get there. It's like, it's, you know, it's like the, we never get there. It's a finite distance, but because space is expanding, because space is expanding, 